And I'd like to pray too. Father, I ask that you would grant me your blessing, your wisdom. Uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I do fear you. I ask, Father, that you would make this profitable for each person that has come here tonight. I pray, Father, that I would be able to impart life-changing truths and experiences and, and um, uh, encouragement. But mostly, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would be glorified in all that we say and all that we do, and that this campus would be totally run uh, one and um, and... Uh, there would be such an outpouring of your spirit for other students to come to know you. So guide my mouth. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Okay, so everything's all set. So my name is Norman Patterson. Um, some of you know me because I go out there and I do some street preaching right here. And um, that's one of the main ministries that I have right now is going out. Um, and just preaching in the street or at the legislative building. I went to the Hartford Legislative Building yesterday and I went in the lobby and just preached Christ and, and the truth of God's word. And, and, um, and I also am an abortion abolitionist. And that's something that's odd for modern day ears to hear. But a, a modern day abolition is somebody that just as in the slavery times, the, the abolitionist called for the uncompromising, immediate end of slavery. Not this incremental, let's do it a little bit at a time. No, they said slavery must end because these are human beings created in the image of God and the modern abolitionist movement, the abortion abolitionist movement is saying the same thing. Pro-life, they do have done some good work, but there's a compromise that's there, even down in Florida. Oh, we're okay with them killing babies up to 12 weeks and an abolitionist would say, why? Why would you be okay with that? If you're okay with this, then you, why, why would you say that you're, you're not okay with that? And so as an abolitionist, I'm forming, um, it's a foundation to abolish abortion here in Connecticut. And eventually we are going to um, introduce legislation to the state of Connecticut to abolish abortion in Connecticut without compromise. Um, and that's a very powerful thing. And, you know, if you know your history, Wilbur Wilberforce, if they said to him, you think that you're going to end slavery? You're out of your mind. In fact, just a little side thing, and then I'll get into the heart of this. I saw last week, Tuesday, that um, the governor and, and the secretary of state had a press conference saying, you know, we're going to have reproductive rights, which we'll talk about how that's a self-contradictory um, presupposition. What is, what is reproductive about reproductive rights? It's, it's not about reproduction whatsoever. And I was lamenting the fact that I did not have an opportunity to be there, and it flew under my radar. And then I was walking by the state capitol, and the governor walked back, almost walked right into me. And at that moment, I said, sir, I want you to know I'm an abortion abolitionist. Abortion is going to end someday here in Connecticut. And he kind of scoffed, and I said, um, someday you're going to stand before God and give an account for all the children that have died underneath your leadership. And he again laughed and I, then he said, I said to him, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Um, some would disagree to um, confront a government official, but I believe that that's the precedent you see in scripture. That's not why I came here to, to talk about. Uh, I was a philosophy student here at Central back in 1982. So the, the title of this talk is What I Wish I Knew when I was a student in 1982. And it's going to center on presuppositional apologetics, defending the faith and sharing the faith, evangelizing. So it's, it's both of those things. And so as I prepared this, I thought about myself as a student. And I've been in these rooms way back in 1982, a student just like you, a Christian student in the philosophy department, taking on the world fighting with the professors, fighting with other students and all that kind of stuff. And I, I, as I prepared this, I said, what would I like to say to myself? How many years ago? 40 years ago. What, would I, what do I wish that I knew? And hopefully in, in, in doing this, 
it will impart some things for you that maybe you could relate to that 20-year-old student, philosophy student here at Central Connecticut, and I'll be able to impart some things to you as students, um, as Christians, most importantly. And I also think about what am I thinking about of if I were sitting here seeing me, and this hit me as I was driving here, what would, I, what would I think about me if I were a student 20 years old looking at, wow, think about yourself someday, right? 40 years from now, what, what kind of person do you want to be? Would you be proud of, you right now be proud of the person that would be in front doing something like this? Would you be proud of that person? And I want you to keep that in mind because all of a sudden, boom, 40 years has gone by. And here I am, I sent a picture to Abigail of my 20-year-old self. I got hair, I got the Fu Manchu. You know, I look really tough and I look really cool as a football captain, you know. Cocky is all get out. Maybe I still am at times. Uh, but you know, sometimes you need that tenaciousness if you're gonna go out into the streets and preach Jesus Christ. So, the basis of the text that I'm gonna use tonight is in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. You know this scripture. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So there's a lot of things that I can talk about tonight, but I'm going to focus on apologetics, defending the faith and evangelism. I believe that these two things must go together because if you're just all about, you know, defending the faith and fighting people and arguing with anybody and you're not concerned about the state of their eternal soul, then I would rather have you be quiet and not speak because, um, because Christianity is not just about you know, winning arguments. So lesson one, lesson one. Lesson one is everybody lives by presuppositions. Everybody lives by presuppositions. And the Bible verse that I believe supports this, there's so many. For the, it, this is in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 22. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and, and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. It's unrighteousness that suppresses the truth. You see, people don't want to hear the truth because they want to do what they want to do in their lives. And if you don't understand that about people, um, you're, you're not going to really get into the heart of being able to defend the faith. Most of the time people are against biblical Christianity is because they got some stuff in their life that they want to continue to do and they don't want anybody, not even God himself, telling them what to do. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature has been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they came, became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise, they became fools. So that's the basic premise of everybody has a presupposition. A presupposition, what is it? What I'm going to be talking about basically is presuppositional apologetics. Most of you are familiar with evidential apologetics, and I'm going to dig into that in just a few minutes. But a presupposition, as the word says, it is something that people presuppose already. So let me read a definition, and then we'll dig into it. A presupposition, this is from Dr. Greg Bonson um, from his book, Van Til's Apologetic. A presupposition is an elementary assumption in one's reasoning or in the process by which opinions are formed. A presupposition is not just any assumption in, a, in an argument, but a personal commitment that is held at the most basic level of one's network of beliefs. See, people hold it in their gut. Presuppositions form a wide-ranging foundational perspective or starting point in terms of which everything else is interpreted 
or evaluated. As such, presuppositions have the greatest authority in one's thinking, being treated as one's least negotiable beliefs and being granted the highest immunity to revision. Let me read that last sentence again. This is very important. As such, presuppositions have the greatest authority in one's thinking, even if a person is not aware of what their presuppositions are. It has the greatest authority in their thinking, being treated as one's least negotiable beliefs and being granted the highest immunity to revision. In other words, you ain't touching that sacred cow because people will guard it and they don't even understand what they're doing and why they're guarding it. Um, and, and that has to do with a person's word, worldview, and you all as Christians have heard about a worldview. And if you've got questions, you know, if you could hold, hold off till the end, but if you've got something that's burning, you know, feel free. This is an informal gathering, but I'm glad to do that. But a worldview is a network of presuppositions. It is how a person perceives the world. And everybody has presuppositions. And one of the terms you'll hear in presuppositional apologetics is the myth of neutrality. You're in your class, right? The professor tries to present them himself or herself as, as um, educated and unbiased. So we're just going to look at this problem from an unbiased point of view. The unbiased point of view, where is God? How can we possibly see God? If I say to God, come on down, I want to see you, we, we won't see him. I'm just being un, unbiased and I'm just waiting for the evidence and if I have enough evidence, then I will believe. That is such a biased presupposition that the person isn't even aware of it. So as a Christian, the one thing, one part of this lesson is what's called the antithesis. If you dig into your Bible, one thing that you will see the scripture says over and over again is there is no middle ground. And this is what I, you all claim Jesus Christ tonight. If you claim to be a follower, a worshiper, a disciple of Jesus Christ, there is no middle ground all throughout the Bible. There is the wicked and there is the godly. There is the unrighteous and there is the righteous. There are the sheep and there are the goats. There is no middle ground. And what the world, the academia, and educated people often want to do is like, ah, oh, we just got this nebulous, um, unbiased area, we're all just going to meet together and, and discuss things. But when you understand that there is no neutrality, people are really committed to where they're coming from, that will help you to understand. I remember being a student, and I wish I understood this when I was a student, because I remember saying, I was saying to somebody, everybody's, everybody is a presupposition. That's what I said when I was 20 years old. Everybody's a presupposition. And I began to like have little inklings of the understanding that everybody has these pre-commitments that they hold to. They're not even aware of it, but it, it affects everything that they see and everything that they hear and everything that they think. The practical application of lesson one is this. Learn to identify your presuppositions. Do you even understand what that means? And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. And learn to gain an understanding of the presuppositions that somebody else has as they are talking with you, as you're listening to a podcast, as you're in a, a, a a classroom, as you're listening to a discussion, whatever it is, start to say, what are the very basic truths that they must assume to be true for their argument, for their worldview to, to hold together? Do you follow me on that? So that's what I, the practical aspect of this one is. Really go deep into it. I'll give you an example, okay? I don't want to keep track of the time because, all right. Yeah, that's fine. Because some of these are going to be longer and some of these points are going to be shorter. So not every one of these points is going to have all this information. But these primary ones need to be there. I'm, I believe in science, right? I believe in science and I only go with the evidence. Well, let's talk about the presuppositions of science. You know, what, 
we'll talk about an atheistic, naturalistic, you know, there is no God type of science. I only go with what I can empirically verify. But what does science actually assume? Science assumes logic, right? It, it, it assumes these, these, these immaterial laws that govern our thinking, the law of non-contradiction and, and so on and so forth. Why would you assume that? Has anybody ever seen the law of non-contradiction walking around? There it is, and we're gonna empirically verify the law of non-contradiction or the law of identity A is A. I've never seen that, can you? No, these are immaterial. So a science must assume something in order for there to be logic and reason and so forth. They must assume the uniformity of nature. All right, David Hume, I learned about him here at the, the philosophy department. He was, a, I believe, was a British atheist, and he basically said that if in a materialistic, atheistic world, you cannot assume the uniformity of nature, what does that mean? The sun's coming up. <laughs> Why would you assume that? Why? Because it's happened in the past. Well, how do you even know that your memories of the past are value? How can you possibly check those types of things? I mean, the Aztecs used to, uh, yeah, yeah, and they believed that their actions actually raised the sun up in the morning. I mean, there's the uniformity of nature. I often th thought about this. This is one of the things that I argued. Hey, guys, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Good, good. These are one of the things that I argued when I was a student. I mean, when you... When you have, you have the sun and it shoots its light into the earth and that, as it does that, the light is reflected off of an object. I'm assuming that the light is coming off in some sort of uniform way. It goes into my eyes, it hits my retina, and then it goes along my optic nerves and then it gets reinterpreted in the occipital load of my brain. Why would I assume that what generated in the sun and bounced off that object is what's being interpreted in my brain. Do you see all the assumptions that m you must have in order to allow there to be observation? That would also be the same thing with touch and feel and smell and all the other empirical evidences that we have. I haven't even, I, I could go into this very deep. I haven't even hit them all. So I just follow the science. Well, how in the world? You're making all kinds of assumptions about science Right? That, how do you prove all these things? All right, that's lesson one. Everybody's a presupposition. Lesson number two, the Bible. This is probably the most important thing I'm going to say tonight. The Bible is the only presupposition that accounts for everything. The question you are asking in presuppositional apologetics is, can this view deliver on the goods? Can it explain the very things of life? And in philosophy, I'll get a little philosophical on you. Can it deliver on the goods? The Bible does. But when you look at other worldviews and other presuppositions, there are three main areas. The first area is metaphysics. Does it explain reality? How do you know what reality is? What, what is reality? I mean, Plato talked all about that with his forms and so forth. Um, you know, there, there, there's this, well, we're going into Platonic philosophy right now, but what is real? Secondly, epistemology is how do you know? How do you know? How do you know that you know? Right? Again, how do I know that the light that's going off of there and is coming into my eye and going through all these processes is the same thing that's out there, is the same thing in there? Because really, you think I'm out here, but really I'm inside your head. It's your brain with all that information that's, that's, that's giving you the understanding that I'm out here, or the assumption that I'm out here. But you could just be a, a brain in a vat like Neo, right? Ethics, how do you know what is right and what is wrong? What is good and what is evil? Presuppositional apologetics, starting with the scripture, can answer all those questions. And that's what's so important. And I want to empower you tonight not to be like, oh, my Bible, and kind of like a little bit embarrassed. Absolutely not. As biblical Christians, we lead with the Bible. It, in, in Reformed theology, it's called sola scriptura. We are, our metaphysics, our epistemology, our ethics are all founded upon, and this is what I say when I'm preaching. 
I'm here preaching to you today when I do street, street preaching. The, the revelation of the one and only self-existing Trinitarian holy God who has revealed himself in his inerrant and infallible self-authenticating word of God. And I'll unpack that a little bit more in a little bit, in a little bit of time. A couple of scriptures, 2 Timothy 3, you're familiar with this? 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Get this scripture here. This one blows me away. And this is one of the primary presuppositions of the Bible. Psalm chapter 36, verse 9 in the King James. For with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light we shall see light. In thy light we shall see light. And presuppositional apologetics says that we must think thoughts, our thoughts after God's thoughts. Because the only true knowledge there is is God himself, right? And the knowledge that we, we have from God. So we can only see because of the light of God. And I'm going to talk more about that in a few minutes. Colossians chapter 3, verse 8. Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elementor, elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. I actually preached on that right out here one day. You know, vain philosophy, we could talk all about, you know, are you a brain in the vat, Aristotle, the logical positivists, and all the other stuff. But this verse, the Bible says, Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. If you do not have Jesus Christ as the center of your wisdom and your knowledge, you are a fool. And you will not be able to make sense of what's happening in the world. So the Bible is the ultimate presupposition. What does that mean, ultimate presupposition? The Bible is self-attesting. Everybody, I guess I would call it the worldview, I'm going to call it now ultimate presuppositions. Everybody holds to an ultimate presupposition, be it I'm God, there is a God, there is no God, or whatever. Ultimate presuppositions are either self-authenticating or they are self-defeating. Why do I believe that the Bible is the, the Word of God? Well, because the Bible says it's the Word of God. Well, isn't that begging the question? That's what you would hear in the philosophy department. You're begging the question. Not at all. Ultimate presuppositions must self-authenticate. Here's why. Because if there is something other than the Bible that authenticates the Bible, validates the Bible, that is a higher authority than Scripture itself. Do you understand what I'm saying by that? You do. Very good. So the Bible is self-authenticating. We do not look for something else outside of the Bible in order to validate it. It is not um, begging the question whatsoever. If something verifies the Bible itself, then um, it would be a higher authority. So a pre uh, ultimate presupposition is either self-authenticating or it is self-defeating. And you all have heard self-defeating ultimate presuppositions. I know you have heard it. I remember as a, a student um, in the sociology class, the teacher went first day, there are no absolutes. What's the question? I asked, is that an absolute statement? He, they, can't, they couldn't even get their minds around that whole concept, that their ultimate presupposition that there are no absolutes, which means you could do whatever the heck you want, going back to Romans chapter 1 that I read earlier, there are no um, absolutes. You are making an absolute statement. So that ultimate presupposition, does it self-authenticate? No, it actually self-collapses. It's self-contradictory. I remember being in the analytical 
um, a class called Analytical Philosophy. We were studying the logical positivists, A.J. Ayer and so forth, and I remember the, the professor, Dr. Leland Career, saying this, truth is only that which you can empirically verify. And I thought, let's think about that for a little bit. Can you empirically verify that statement? You can't. You can't take, where, where did you come up with the notion scientifically that truth is only that which you can empirically verify? It's self-collapsing. It, it, it self-destructs. Self People make this, these type of statements all the time. And, and so as you begin to identify people's presuppositional worldview, I mean, you could have some fun with it. If, a terrible way to say it. I, I don't know if it's a terrible way, but I even talk about, I didn't plan this in my notes. What about uh, non-binary? If I argue with somebody that says that, you know, the, the universe is non-binary, all is one and one is all, really that's the basis of Eastern philosophy. Well, and if I say, no, that's not true, and they say to me, you're wrong, there is no, you cannot have a contradiction in a non-binary universe. So the whole thing collapses in and on itself, but people don't think. And one of the things you guys have to understand in your generation, it is not about logic anymore. It is not about reason anymore. It is about feeling, it is about uh, social justice, it is all about all kinds of stuff, but people cannot reason anymore. Even Christians don't have the ability to reason anymore. But that doesn't leave you off the hook. You need to still be able to understand these things and defend the faith. And that's why I, I'm here of doing that. And I'm going to continue. The, how, how am I doing for time? 7.40. Wow. It's just, all right. I wanted to say just a little bit about presuppositional apologetics versus evidential apologetics. You probably all have been raised on evidential presuppositions. You see some TikTok. Who's that guy, Cliff? I can't exactly. even... Yeah, I mean, I love what he does. I, I, he goes on college campuses, does a, what a wonderful job. But evidential presupposition, or evidential apologetics has an assumption. And the assumption is there's this like neutral middle ground that I was talking about and people are unbiased. And the other assumption is that what you're doing with people with evidentialism is you are putting the unbeliever in the seat of judgment over the Bible, who already is prejudiced against the Bible, has, has already committed to be against what the scripture has to say. And if I will even be so bold, the Bible says that people without Jesus Christ are dead in their trespasses and their sins. Ezekiel chapter 36 says that this person has a heart of stone, that the Holy Spirit must take away the heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. And so if I, and this is what I learned as a student, if I'm constantly trying to give them evidence of the truth of biblical Christianity. I used to do this all the time. Well, what about Cain? Where did he get his wife? You know, and so you come back and you answer that question. Oh, what about on and on and on and on? And you will never find that there is an end where the person goes say, oh, thank you. I appreciate it. You've answered all my questions. Now I'm going to be a believer in Jesus Christ. You're just not going to find that. So... I mean, there's a lot. I'm just going right through here with evidential apologetics, but I think I've explained myself pretty well in that, so I'm going to just move on. Lesson three. Norman, young Norman, you can't argue somebody into salvation. You can't argue somebody into salvation. And why? And the Bible's very clear, and I hinted at that just a moment ago. It goes back to the myth of neutrality. Not only is there a bias, again, I hit at it, there's a root reason. Because the Bible talks about people are born into this world. After Genesis chapter 3, they are born physically alive but spiritually dead. And so we are talking about things of the kingdom. We're talking about light with people with no eyes. We're talking about life that of, with people who are spiritually dead. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 
we must understand that the conversion of a soul is a supernatural work of the Spirit of God upon a person. That doesn't mean that we should not contend for the faith, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, witness to people. And one of the reasons I street preach, you know, why I'm out here, because I believe in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, for example, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of truth. So faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Our job is to be faithful and present the word of God. I believe what the scripture is saying here is that as we proclaim the word of God, we don't know who the sheep and who the goats are. And anybody who thinks that they do, you, either you're not going to evangelize or you're going to be just a, a, an awful terrible Christian because you're going to assume that you know a very judgy Christian. You don't know. We can say your life is in sin and you need to get right from, f with Jesus Christ. We can say that, but we cannot say to a person, you, you are not going to be saved. You're going to hell no matter what. We don't know. The Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, can take that heart of stone, as it talks about in Ezekiel 36, and give them a heart of flesh just because of a word that you spoke or a witness that you gave in class or proclamation or a tract that you handed out or whatever it is that you do. You don't know what the Spirit of God is going to do and you don't know who he's going to teach or, or change or convert. And that gives me hope. That gives me hope. And I don't have to do, you know, all kinds of uh, dog and pony shows. The, the, the modern church, I have a lot of issues with the modern church. And a lot of the times it seems that the modern church is, is trying to appeal to the goats, entertain. See, um, Haddon Spurgeon said that what you do to get people to come to church or Christ, you're going to have to keep giving it to them in order to keep them. And that's why preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ is so important. Lesson four, it's not about winning an argument, it's about winning souls. It's, it's about winning souls. I love to win arguments, I really do. And I, you know, I always record myself out on the street and I evaluate myself and there are times I go, ah, I didn't do a good job on that because I won that argument, but I lost that person <laughs> completely. I just shredded their arguments to smithereens. And I was very proud of the work that I did, put it up on YouTube and look at Norman Patterson, look how great he did in that. What an apologist he is for Christ. And I was just a jerk. I didn't really care about the person. I cared about winning the argument. Lesson five, the best defense is a good offense. And for the script, scripture of this one, it is Proverbs chapter 26, verses 4 and 5. And this is a scripture that has always confused me. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. And then he says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. Now what in the world is this a contradiction with in the Bible? I don't think so. I think verse 4 is basically saying, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto them. That is that understanding that they are not unbiased. They are very biased. Um, that their worldview um, has problems, and it is our job to get into that worldview. In verse 5, you do an internal critique of their worldview, and I did a couple simple ones with that one. You know, there are no absolutes. Well, let's dig into that. Is that an absolute statement? Sometimes you can do this, and that leads me to, to lesson six. Learn to listen and ask questions. That's very important. Learn to listen and ask questions. Jesus Christ was the master question asker. Matthew chapter 16, verse 15. To his disciples about his identity, he says, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? Mark 40, uh, Mark 4, verse 40, 
why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? <laughs> I mean, we, I, I have a list of 20 questions of that. When you get into it, John chapter 5, verse 6, do you want to get well? The power of the question is so important when you're witnessing for Jesus Christ. Taking that time to ask the question and, and see what a person has to say. I did make a written note. It's okay as a Christian to say, I don't know. I don't know. And sometimes I always want to argue, and I don't want you to think that I don't know because I want you to be impressed with me. So I'll just argue for the sake of arguing. But it's okay in a classroom that you get nailed by a question and you feel embarrassed. Oh my goodness, I don't know how to answer this. It's okay to say, I don't know. The second thing that I would say practically of this one is ask the person to define their terms. If you're in a, a, a class and the, the professor or students or you're in a discussion, people are throwing around terms, ask them to define their terms. What do you mean by that? I don't, I don't understand what you mean by X, Y, and Z. And, and the more questions you ask, the more you get a better understanding of what it is that they're saying. Lesson seven. You represent Jesus Christ right here on campus. The verse that to support this is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead be ye reconciled to God. Now then, ye are ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador, the word that Paul is using here, is as if... I was a king, and I sent John out as my representative, and he has the, the authority that I have to speak on my behalf, so that when John speaks, he's speaking on my behalf. He's speaking. You have to listen to him as if he's speaking my words. You are ambassadors of Jesus Christ, so that when you go out there into the world, you go into the campus, you're there, understand that you have been sent by God himself to be a representative. Don't be shy about that. But understand that the great weight that that is, but also the great liberty that there is in all of that. But I have a note here, and this is important that I wish I understood when I was in your place. Jesus Christ said in John chapter 15, verses 18 through 19, if the world hates you, Keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belonged to this world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Make no mistake, brothers and sisters. <laughs> the world hates you. They hate Christ in you. And some people are indifferent, whatever, but as you stand out there for Jesus Christ, do not expect the world, the flesh, and the devil to say, hooray, I'm so happy that you're doing what it is that God wants you to do. And when you get over that very quickly, you will understand and you'll be able to take the opposition. I do think, I do think that there is more and more opposition and persecution that is coming. I think your generation is going to see it. I think I will see it in my lifetime. I'm reading a, book, reading a book right now, Live Not By Lies, which is a quote by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, um, who wrote the Gulag Archipelago. I can't even say the word. Um, and basically what the book is showing is how there is a soft totalitarianism that is coming that is present already here in the United States. I mean, we got phones, they're listening, right? I'm not just talking conspiracy theories. They got facial recognition. You can, Bank of America, they want to cut my bank account. I often think, how did that happen? Soviet Union, 60 million people were killed in Soviet Union. Christians were targeted. In Mao China, it was probably 50 to 60 million people. In Nazi Germany, it's more like 40 million people, according to R.J. Rummel in his book, uh, Death by Government, Democide. What makes you think that that's not going to happen here in the United States? You need to be prepared. And while the church right now is kind of happy, clappy, doing its thing, the church in the United States of America is not cutting it. 
And if it was cutting it, we would not have the social issues that are happening today, the push of all of the sin that's happening in our world today. Be prepared, brothers and sisters. Um, I, you know, I, I, am I being prophetic? I don't know. No, I'm just telling what the, the Bible says. If you seek to follow Christ, I didn't write this verse down. It's in the book of James. You will be persecuted. You will be persecuted. It's coming. I went out street preaching with a young man the other day. He wants to be a preacher. And I told him all kinds of wisdom. And at one point I turned to him and I said to him, if you're not willing to die, go home. If you're not willing to die for Christ, go home. Because you may. I mean, somebody may come and say, you know, you, you whatever. And boom. Happened in Phoenix, I think. Remember that guy? Yeah, I remember that guy. Uh, that was not in my notes, but you represent Jesus Christ and understand that. Nobody's going to stand up and cheer. Sometimes, it, I, I, it's tough for me, I, I tell you. I don't get a lot of people cheering. They, people think I'm, I'm weird. They think I'm strange. I got people in my, my own family who say, oh man, he's a weirdo. He's going out in the streets and he's preaching Jesus Christ. How embarrassing. And sometimes even students here are saying, you're, you're kind of embarrassing us, you know? You're giving Jesus Christ a bad name by standing up there and saying these types of things. But I do believe I'm completely convinced that this is what the Word of God calls me to do. I think it calls us all to do it in our own way. But I am convinced, I mean that this is what God has called me to do. And you, you can't convince me otherwise. And even if the whole world and even if the whole Christian church says, you are, you know, you're weird, you're strange, you're whatever, unless I'm preaching something that's heretical, no way. I'm just, we're going down to Yale tomorrow and stand there with the students down in Yale and call these sinners to repentance in Jesus Christ because they need to hear that. Lesson eight, I got just a couple more. These go rather quickly. Know your Bible and your doctrine. Know your Bible and your doctrine. I'm, I'm going through, and I'm, I'm 61 years old now, and I wish I did these things earlier. I got a nice app on my iPhone. Um, it's a memory app for memorizing Scripture, and I'm going through it and I'm memorizing Scriptures. It's, I, I don't do that well. My siblings just are, my brother can rattle off quotes of movies, you know, this long. I just can't do that. My mind is more conceptual. I'll take the concept and get rid of the particulars, and I'll give you what the concept was, but I don't do well at the particulars. But, but the, the ability to memorize, it's a skill that you can acquire, and you, it, I think it's very important to memorize Scripture. Secondly, I, there, I believe there needs to be a backdrop of sound, basic theology. This is where the church is very lacking right now. And this is why false teaching is coming into the church just in, in truckloads. The, the average Christian doesn't even believe that Jesus Christ is God. If you begin to, to get into people's understanding that the Bible has errors in it. I mean... I went to task with Dr. Greg Boyd. Um, I got a whole thing about his, his uh, I did a presuppositional evaluation of his cruciform thing. If, there's a, if this book has mistakes, how do you know? What standard are you using to tell me what those mistakes are? And how do you know where those mistakes are? If you believe that or assume that as a Christian, you've just lost and undermined the very basic most precious presupposition that you have, and we are then left with just humanism and subjectivism, and you know it's up for grabs. I personally, I'm also memorizing the Westminster Confession Shorter Catechism, which was back in the day, you know, back in the 1800s, kids used to memorize it. So you know, here I am, an adult memorizing it, but it is important. And that backdrop of theology, sound doctrine, Paul does say to Timothy. Granted, he's speaking to a, a, an elder, but I think this applies to all of us. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And ultimately, I, this is something I believe, People want to hear a justification so that they could do whatever sin they want. That's ultimately behind bad theology is, is the desire to sin. That's the conclusion that I did not write here. But it leads into lesson nine. 
Fear God, brothers and sisters. You know, we'll, you'll hear people say, you know, fear, the fear of the Lord means just the respect of God. And it does mean that, and I affirm that. But we have this kind of informal, yeah, God, Abba, Father, through Jesus Christ, 100%, all of that is absolutely true. But if you do not have a fear of God, then you do not really understand who it is that we're dealing with, this being that you know, holds the universe in his hand and created everything out of nothing. <clears throat> and the fact that you are um, a son or daughter of God, Hebrews chapter 12 is very clear that God will discipline those whom he loves. And I, I will say just briefly that as a pastor, I went through a time about nine years ago, eight, nine years ago, where I had a secret life going. And I was pastor in front, and everybody thought, wow, that guy's really wonderful and whatever. And I lost everything. My marriage, the church I was pastoring, my reputation, absolutely everything. It was the most humiliating, painful thing that I can possibly tell you, here's myself, I would say, don't do it. <laughs> if I had myself here, don't do it. But God is faithful, and he chastised me as his son. And now, those things that, that caught my eye back then, no way. No way, man. I fear God, first of all, and I don't want that garbage in my life. I don't want it. So get right with God. Don't, don't start indulging. Don't indulge in that stuff that you know what I'm talking about. Don't do it. And in our, our world today, in our Christian church today, it has just gotten very um, loosey-goosey. Have your personal life in order. And if you don't, God will. God will chastise you. And it, it is not fun. But it will bring about, as it says in Hebrews, a harvest of righteousness and peace. And then the last lesson... And everybody throws this in as if it's a kind of a cliche, but this is not a cliche, and maybe I should have started with it, but I did start with it. Pray. Pray. Take that time to pray. We are not wrestling against flesh and blood. You got the world against you, you got the devil against you, and you got your own flesh that is fighting against you, right? You are a child of God, but even your body, that, that sin dwells in our bodies. And I tell you, that can be very powerful. But we need to really stay with the Lord and pray and be right with God and take that time every day. I don't want it to be a legalistic thing. You know, I had a pastor that used to get up 5 o'clock every morning. I was like, oh, I got, I got to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. God hears you however you... I can't get in an office on my knees and pray. I have to walk. That's how I pray. I just get out and I walk. I, stick, I got a one-year-old son. I stick him on my backpack and I just walk for you know, an hour or whatever it is, and I just pray. And I'm learning something about prayer, and I'm going to close with this, that this was not planned. So many times our prayers are just kind of like, oh, yeah, there's Joe, he asked for prayer, and maybe we don't, I'll pray for you, and we don't pray for him, or we just pray these little lame prayers. The, the, the prayers of a, the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I'm learning by the examples of people in Scripture that, it's important to talk to God and reason with him. Abraham did it, right? Moses did it. If you destroy the people of Israel, all the nations around here are going to say that you're not strong enough and you're not a powerful God, so please do not you know, pour your wrath upon them. Take the time and really articulate it and be passionate in your prayer. Be articulate in your prayer with God. Don't just you know, mumble your prayers and go through that. I do believe... I do believe, and I think I could back this up as scripture, that God blesses and honors a person who prays with passion, prays with their heart, prays, cries, for goodness sakes. You know, things that are on your heart. Pray. And, and pray not just with your mind and just with your mouth, but pray with your whole being. And lay those things that are on your heart and mind before God. So those are the ten lessons. Um, I hope they've been helpful, and I'm happy to entertain any questions or have any kind of discussion that would be helpful to you. And I have this just to pick up on your sound a little bit more. Any, any thoughts or questions? I, I threw a lot out at you, and, but you know, I, 
I actually cut out about half of it. So. <laughs> but we got through the lessons. Any thoughts or comments or questions? Yeah. How do you start uh, understanding scripture to that level to be able to go out and practice apologetics? Like, where do you start to get your, obviously you have your foundation upon the gospel, but then reading back into the Old Testament as well as the New Testament and really formulating the presuppositions that God is saying? I would say a couple of things to that. One, just make a systematic reading of the Bible and make that part of your life. You can put on, I mean, we, we live, we got our smartphones. Put, get an app, you could do it on YouTube, and just, you could start listening to the Bible. Um, and just read or listen to the Bible and just loop it every, be it every year, every couple of years. Um, just going through and reading the Bible is very important. Um, I've read the Bible in English many times, and I read it in Spanish too. Um, and that was a really great experience to read the whole Bible in Spanish. Um, the second thing is, I would say, listening to good, solid preaching. Good, solid preaching. There's a lot of preachers out there. Right now, I am on a Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones kick. The man is amazing. I'm surprised it took me 60 years. I'm 61. I started um, a couple of months ago. I, I cannot get enough of this man's preaching. It is, you might find it very dry. I, I cry. I mean, I just get excited. And all he does, he does not give all these wonderful stories, you know, oh, Phil did this and my dog did that. No, he just exposits the scripture. So I think also, sola scriptura would lead to exegesis. And this is, a, this is a whole nother lecture. Exegesis is pulling out of the Bible what's there. Exe, right? Jesus exegeted the Father in John chapter 1. So when you approach the Word of God, you are approaching it at, it is the Word of God. And so what you're doing is, this is the lens through which you look. My goal in my life is to think biblically about absolutely everything. That is my goal. Um, and it may mean, you know, getting a thesaurus, not a thesaurus, a uh, concordance and so forth and going through it. So good preaching and also just um, understanding what it is that when you are approaching the word of God, you are actually, you have the authoritative word of God. You could get into some evidentialism. I'm not against evidences of the scripture as a presuppositionalist whatsoever. It is important to be able to defend the scripture. Somebody says, well, the book has been corrupt. Like the Islam. Oh, the Bible has been changed. What, where's the evidence for that? Show me the evidence of that. So it's the attitude also when you come to the Bible. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Yeah, and it's a process. It just keep going through. But good, solid preaching and teaching is really good. Find good, solid, biblical Christian teachers. There's a lot of lousy ones out there. Believe me. But I would start, you know, Vadi Bakum. I, I really love Vadi Bakum. Um, I went on a kick for, with uh, Greg Bonson. He's a presuppositionalist. And you're going to hear Christendom, a, a lot of people putting down presuppositionalism. Um, and I, I think that's a, a huge mistake. Um, I'm not going to get into why I think so, but yeah. Other thoughts or questions? What do you mean? Say more. Earlier you said like some people have more of a heart of stone. Every human being that is born into this world besides Jesus Christ has a heart of stone. Every human. Uh, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, for example, <laughs> you who were dead in your sins and your trespasses. In, these are scriptures I memorized. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him. So the Bible is very clear that people are spiritually dead. So that is an assumption about humanity, and it must be the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit that will take a, a, a dead heart and regenerate it and make that person alive. In that case, how do you do it to yourself? 
Um, it's not something that you can do to yourself. It's only what the Spirit of God does to you. Uh, and if you're asking the question, am I saved? That's ultimately the question. And I would say to a person who is, I don't know if that's your question, a person who's saying, I wonder if I'm saved or not. Dead people don't care about that. Dead people don't care. You know, I, I often say on the street, and this is not my quote, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people live. And when you understand that as a Christian. So, but the Bible also does talk about mortifying the flesh. That there are things we, you know, flee from sin. Do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies. We have a responsibility as people of children of the light, children of God, to, to make sure that we do things. There's a couple of things. You need to be part of a church. In a church that practices church discipline, I would add, which most churches, I, I do not know. What is church discipline? Church discipline, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. There was a guy who was living with his father's, you know, wife or something, you know, his, his, his mother-in-law in some form, and he was sleeping with her, and they were all like, hey, man, look how cool we are. You know, we're really tolerant. We're really with the sign. And Paul says, no, turn that man over to Satan so that he might repent of his sins. So church discipline means there are many levels of discipline, but part of church discipline is, and if you are in sin, that you would have elders in your church, pastors in your church, people in your church, men in your church, for you as young men, for ladies, that come alongside of you and say, hey, brother, no, you can't, you can't be doing this. And if you're having these different struggles with pornography or anything else like that, um, you know, you'll have brothers that will come alongside and say, we're going to hold you accountable. And if, we, if, you, if, if you don't do what God calls you to do, then as a church, we're going to take more steps. I, you know, we're not talking about spanking somebody, but we're talking about lovingly, caringly calling somebody to accountability and helping them to get out of whatever sin they happen to be in. I know that's not your question specifically, but I, I wanted to tail that onto it. No, so those are good questions. Uh, honestly, it's not, those are not hills I would die on. You know, if somebody wanted to argue with me about that section, was the woman caught in adultery, was that actually a part of the Bible or not? I'm not going to die on that. I think it was Sir Frederick Kenyon, an archivist in England, he said, no cardinal doctrine of the church rests on the disputed reading. Very good. You don't find like the Trinity, the virgin birth, oh man, the ending of Mark, it messes up uh, Cardinal, it doesn't. So you, there's enough there with what we know. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. That's excellent. Yeah. By the way, John has a de master's degree in apologetics, so it's wonderful to have him here. Yeah. Well, I was the oddball at Biola University as a pre-sub guy, and I was dealing with people. You can't start with the Bible. Some of my classmates, to be fair, the, the professors were kind of in the middle on that issue. And, you know, I found in Scripture, as Norm said, that the apostles argued from the Scripture, not to the Scripture. Yeah. There's a big difference between from and to, those two prepositions. They started, even in Acts 17, where Paul quotes the pagan poets, in him we live, but what he told them, everything was in the Old Testament, and they ended up calling him a babbler. <laughs> so, I mean, and he, you know, he had that heart. And the other thing I just want to say, too, if you want to know what he talked about, the church, the state of theology, if you just go to the website, stateoftheology.com, it gives you, over the years, 60% of evangelicals, people in pews that identify as evangelicals, I should say, Jesus Christ is not God. Like he said, you could see the stats there, and it was done through Ligonier Ministries and another group, I can't remember, if it was like a Barna, kind of like, and, and you see the longitudinal, there's a slip in basic doctrine. If you don't know Jesus Christ is God, then you got big problems. Yeah. You need to get saved, but... Yeah. I also go out with a motivation um, because it's not just apologetics, it's evangelism. Yes. And, and my heart is um, people, I, the Bible is very clear, there is a hell 
There is a lake of fire that is coming. There is a judgment. And this is hard for modern day Christians to say. And just do a little word study on the wrath of God. Um, it's very serious. And people, if we, you don't repent, I'll say this out on the street, you are under the wrath of God. Does God love everybody? Yeah, there is a benevolent love that God has for all human beings. But yet there are sheep and there are goats. And God commands us to go out and evangelize and call people to repentance. One of the things people don't realize is that the sermon that Jesus Christ preached all throughout his ministry is the sermon of repentance. That's one of his primary messages that he always preached. I mean, we only have this much of what Jesus Christ preached. We have the essence and the heart of all that. He didn't preach anything contradiction to what's in the scripture, but there's a lot in the scripture. Other thoughts or questions? Yeah, I would go. I have a question. You mentioned the myth of neutrality. Mm -hmm. And I'm going into education. I want to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing a lot of research on where education and religion stand right now. Mm. And there's this idea in modern education about moral neutrality. Mm. And how, as an educator, would you suggest, as a Christian educator, you approach that in a pub public field oh, where yeah. people don't hold to Christianity and within the public sphere, you're not allowed to promote Christianity within the public education? You, yeah, you, you have you're going to need the Spirit of God for wisdom on that because, you know, there are so many agendas that are coming now that it's going to... The, the soft totalitarianism that is happening in the United States today is the silencing of any oppositions. If, and anything that you say as a Christian will be interpreted as hate speech. You will not say anything against any human being. I was preaching the other day out on the streets and I was talking about God's standard for, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery. And somebody got into my face and they started yelling at me. I have, you know, somebody in my family that, you know, are, are, are gay and so her, her words. And, and I love them and, and so on and so forth. Be, be, even preaching the gospel out there is being perceived as hate speech. So... It's going to be tough for you. You know that. Um, and what happened in, as I read the book, Live Not By Lies, what, one of the things that happened in the, the totalitarian societies of Russia and China and so on are people had to compromise whatever they needed to compromise in order to keep their jobs and so forth. And so then they would hold to their convictions in their private life. And that tension for these people became greater and greater and greater. The premise of this book is he's talking to people that came out of Czechoslovakia, Poland, and so forth. These are old people saying, what's happening in the United States happened in my country. Mm -hmm. It's happening and they're terrified to see how it's happening, but it comes in in a different form. It has come in in a very different form than so forth. Um, so Abigail, I don't know how to answer that question except to say you have a huge challenge in front of you. Um, to How do you be a light where it, as soon as you expose that light, they will cancel you, fire you, uh, discipline you, and so forth? That's going to be very difficult. But yet, God will call you to be a light there and do it anyways. There's a book you might want to pick up. I think it's written by an atheist, if I'm not mistaken. It's called The Marxification of Education, mm. and it's written by James Lindsay. Oh, James I, Lindsay, I, sure. I don't think he's a believer, but he documents in the book how it's gone. It's not so much, it's, it's indoctrination, basically. Mm. It's called The Marxification of Education. Yeah. And... Um, I'm telling you, as a librarian for the state of Connecticut, I was talking to my boss the other day, and I don't know, I'm not trying to get into politics here, but outside the Dallas Public Library, there's a mural of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. There's more work to be done. I showed my boss, well, I don't have a problem. I said, so if we put Trump up there as, as a library director, I said, I wouldn't want that up there either. Well, you can't remain neutral now in education or librarianship. And I'm like, what, what does that mean? And so, it, if we're supposed to present both points of view, my boss was kind of like hesitant there. She lets me order books that represent the conservative side, 
but there she was, and that's what you're dealing with, and that's why it's going to be challenging. But get that book, The Marxification of Education by Lindsay. I haven't read it, but I was going to order it, and I got some pushback from my boss, who's pretty neutral, but then I said, you want to put it in the BAM Books Week? If we're not going to order it, then and she kind of like, you know, rethought that through. But One of the things I'm thinking, Abigail, you know, I'm, I was talking to my 20-year-old self, and I have gone a journey that I would never have expected me to go in from my, when I was 20 years old as a philosophy major. There's, there's similarities. I mean, my, my, my earning life, I collect yellow jackets and hornets from medical labs. Hmm. You know, I, I buy and sell bugs and I remove yellow jackets and hornets from people's homes organically and I sell them. And that, that's how I make my money. How, how would I ever go from that to that? You just never know. But God is preparing you to, be the, to do what it is that he wants you to do. You are going to end up in places and doing things that you never thought possible, you can't even conceive of now, but God is going to use you in great ways. I have no doubt in my mind. And you, the word that I would say to you is just be open to the Spirit. Be willing to trust the sovereignty of God, even in persecution and suffering and for a time, it will be difficult, but who knows? Maybe God will use you to start a whole new education system in the United States of America. I don't know, mm. but wow. Yeah, bloom where you're planted. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any other thoughts or questions? Did this make sense? Go ahead. Um, maybe like when you probably heard this question, maybe when you've been out, but what would you say to somebody who comes up to you and says, can you prove to me that God exists, or can you give me the evidence that God exists without using the Bible? I would say absolutely not. Absolutely not. I would not even begin. Look up Dr. Greg Bonson, his debate with uh, Howard Stein. He's, he, he's arguing with an atheist, and one of the things he says at the very beginning is, I'm not just going to argue that there is a God, and this is part of the stuff that I left out. As Christians, we believe and we prove the God of the Bible. So what is the, what's, what's the irrefutable proof of the God of the Bible? The impossibility of the contrary. This is something I yeah. took out. The impossibility of the contrary. If you take out the God of the Bible, you cannot prove anything. Biblical Christianity provides all the necessary preconditions for intelligibility is the terminology that a presuppositional, presuppositionalist would use. So if you assume there is no God, you can't prove anything. You've taken out the foundation of science, of reason, of logic, of ethics, of, of epistemology, of metaphysics, of everything. You're left with anything. I actually argued with a student here. He was arguing with no God. I said, okay, let's argue from your point of view. I'll answer the fool according to his folly. All right, let's start. What's, what's your meaning? What do you know to be true? How do you know? And he started making claims. I said, you just borrowed that from my Christian worldview. You just, you just borrowed truth and contradiction and meaning. If a person is a consistent uh, materialistic atheist, for, for example, we're just atoms, accidental atoms floating through who knows what. You can't, they, they have no basis to say anything. Even for them to make a meaningful statement, they've just borrowed from my Christian worldview. Yeah. So if you presuppose that the God of the Bible does not exist, you cannot prove anything. It, it, biblical Christianity provides the necessary foundation for proof itself. It's called a transcendental argument. And it's a, it's a different, what are the necessary preconditions for knowledge? That's a transcendental argument. Immanuel Kant is the one that actually came up with transcendental arguments. And um, the Christian presuppositionalists have just understood that that's where we're coming from. Does, does that make sense to you? Good. Okay, I, I mean, I threw a lot of techni technical stuff in this little bit of time, but if you get that, you know, look those terms up or look up some good YouTube videos. Uh, Dr. Greg Bonson is out of this world, one of the most brilliant minds I've ever encountered. May I and, quote and, Bonson? What's that? May I quote Bonson? Short quote. Yeah, please. Imagine a person who comes in here tonight and argues no air exists, but continues to breathe air while he argues. 
Now, intellectually, atheists continue to breathe. They continue to use reason, draw scientific conclusions, which assumes an orderly universe to make moral judgment, judgments, which assumes absolute values. But the atheistic view of things, would, in theory, would make such breathing impossible. They are breathing God's air all the time. They are arguing against them. Mm, that's exactly right. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. So presuppositional apologetics is very is a very it's powerful because it's it's just simply biblical. It, we're just given modern terminology to what the Bible says. In His light we see light. That's presuppositional apologetics. So just to follow up. Yeah. On that, just talking to somebody who might ask you these questions now. If I said, so can you prove the legitimacy of the Bible, the um, that it's truth and not? You might have touched upon this already mm -hmm. before, but that it's truth and not just a story. Mm -hmm. That it's not just written as a... Yeah, and that's where so, some evidentialism could, could come in, um, certainly. The, mm -hmm. It is backed up in archaeology. I mean, Luke, in the very beginning of his book, he was a physician, and he said, I write these things to you, uh, Theophilus, so that you may be certain of the truth, or I'm not quoting it exactly. So the secular historians will use the book of Luke to understand and determine you know, some of the, the Caesars and so forth that are there. So we can certainly verify many things in the Bible from historical evidence, archeological evidence and so forth. But as a presuppositionalist, I say, no, actually the Bible is the one that verifies history, verifies archeology, span verifies on and on. I mean, there are many different things that have, have they, they said, well, that's in the Bible, we can't find it, and then archeology span comes up, I think it was the Hittites. All of a sudden they find the Hittites and there they are. But I wouldn't get so much into that because I would move that discussion to sin, salvation, conversion, getting right with God. Where will you spend eternity? You need to repent of your sin. I would, I would move it towards those types of questions because ultimately speaking, I, I was a Method, United Methodist pastor and in the denomination, I found and discovered that people have intellectual problems with the Bible because they want to sin. And I, that's coming out of the Bible, Romans chapter 1. But you're going to find if you start getting where they're on the judge of the Bible and you're trying to prove the authenticity and so forth of the Bible, you, you can't win because it's already, they're predisposed presuppositionally against what the scripture has to say. There are no such things as miracles, so you know, the resurrection could not have happened. They, they don't even allow there to be room for a miracle. It basically comes down to what's your source for truth, yes. justice, morals, meaning, and beauty. And the atheists that visited my house couldn't answer those questions. But then, oh, I know it's not the scripture. Wait a minute, I'm not asking you what it's not. If you know what it's not, you must know what it is. And he cannot answer what's, what's your source for truth. It's not going to tell you how to gap spark plugs. It's not a knowledge book like that. But for truth, justice, morals, meaning, and beauty, you can't beat it. I mean, <laughs> well, ultimately speaking, and this is the last thing I'm going to say. And again, this uh, this could be a whole semester of information. Um, our understanding of knowledge must be something that is relevatory. It must be given to us by revelation. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're just caught in the, the trap of humanism in our own minds. And that's why revelation is so important. That's why we need a self-existing revelation from God. Otherwise, it's just human opinion. Exactly. And I, this is what I preached yesterday at the state capitol in the, in the lobby. You jettison the word of God and you have Joseph Stalin because... You, going from that, you have relativism. Relativism turns into you know, survival of the fittest, Darwinianism. Darwinianism turns into might makes right. And that's what we have right here in Connecticut, might makes right. And statism. Statism, worship of the state. Worship of the state. You'll worship something. The question is, what will it be? Yeah. Was it Bob Dylan? You got to serve somebody? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'll throw one more question in. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. But I don't care if there is or isn't a God, I can, I'm still here, so I'm still doing my thing. And what do you mean by good? Yeah, that's true. The question, what do you mean by good? Striving for what? 
How do you know? The, the, I'm going to close with this because my mind is getting tired and I skip this. One of the most important questions you can ask somebody as a Christian is, how do you know? How do you know? How do you know that? How do you know that? How do you know that? Learn to say that over and over again. That's a beautiful question to fall back on when you're not sure what to say. How, how do you know that? And as soon as they say good, evil, progress, so on and so forth, they're assuming a whole worldview. Usually a Christian worldview, but they get rid of Jesus Christ and all of that. The Hitler did his own thing too. I'm just here doing my own thing. Oh, he was helping along evolution. Yeah. That's Hitler ultimately. Did his own thing. Yeah. Paul, what, Paul, what, Pol Pot. Paul, Cambodia. Yeah. I mean, a few million people to wipe them out. It's no big deal. Yeah. And the top three killers in human history are utopian atheists. So, yeah, people died at the Inquisitions, the Salem witch trials. Yes, Christians and people who claim and it's not perfect, but if we're going to have a body back count. Atheism has got a heck of a lot more yeah, than, than basic theism, even for, you know. Well, let's, let's pray. My brain shuts off about 8.30. Mm. Father, I thank you for these brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, I trust and I pray that your spirit would speak what needs to be spoken to each person. I ask, Lord, whatever lessons are for them from your word, that it would penetrate their hearts and, and that they would be transformed by the renewing of their minds. I ask, Lord, that you would make them as bold as lions. I pray, Father, that they would be such a light and witness for Jesus Christ. I ask that there would be things that I was able to impart tonight that they would be able to use practically to um, evangelize and defend the faith. And more importantly, that people will come to know Jesus Christ because of them. I ask, Lord, that there would be world changers here tonight and that um, you have used many other people, but you would use me in their life to do great things for the kingdom. And Father, if it ever comes to the place where we are oppressed, we are persecuted, and um, just all hell breaks loose, I ask that they would stand strong, that they would not compromise, and that they would uh, be bold for the name and the cause of Jesus Christ. I bless them, and I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for inviting me. I really, really appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much for coming. Yes, thank oh, you. you're very welcome. I, I hope I, I always walk away. Did I throw too much at you? And I, I hope I didn't throw no. too, too much at you. Not Good. at all. Not Great. at all. You Great. guys could survive philosophy class. You could survive this. <laughs> yeah. It's a blessing.